My name is Draw John. I'm uh, doing something with threat intelligence at DCSO. Uh, hi, my name is Alicia. I'm a data scientist at DCSO um, in the threat intelligence team, which is led by Draw. Yep, and uh, we wanted to share with you today um, a report on a project which we uh, did over the last, uh, well, like eight to nine months. Um, and actually, it all started with a simple question, like who gives the best, best bang for, for the buck? Um, so talking about uh, money or um, uh, basically a, a little bit more precisely, uh, which dollar vendor best complements our existing um, APT detection solutions um, on our network sensors? Um, so we set out on a mission and uh, defined a project and started to work um, and try to answer that question. Ah, thanks. So this project felt like an adventure. There were lots of ups, quite a few downs, a lot of emotions, some tears even. So we thought today we'd like to present it to you um, as a mission with a primary objective, which was, like George just said, identify the best TI vendor for our purposes. And um, we also included a few secondary objectives, which were to compare the TI vendors using a standard format build some open, open source tooling around it, um, develop some metrics um, to compare these vendors and their data, and finally share the experience and knowledge uh, with you um, today and hopefully in the future as well. Um, so today we'll go through the various steps of that mission. We'll start by going over the context, um, some of the literature around it, Next, we'll talk about some of the expectations we had going in and how we expected our end result to look like. Um, we'll talk about how we selected the different TI providers, um, how we eventually got the data from them, how we stored it, um, the data magic we performed on the data, and finally, the takeaways and learnings um, that we had at the end. Yeah, uh, so maybe um, to just give you a little bit of background, um, when we talk about understanding um, indicators or understanding of threat intelligence, there's uh, obviously a lot of previous work, and uh, most notably, um, obviously, this stuff from uh, Alex Pinto and Kyle Maxwell, which started round about in uh, 2014 with the presentations uh, at DEF CON, so that's the, the so-called TIC test, um, TI uh, intelligence uh, testing, um, quite interesting tooling also released about, um, around that, and um, it's very much focused on uh, uh, quantitative comparison of indicators of compromise from various sources. Um, and a current version of the TIC test was just released earlier this year, I believe around January. Um, version 2 of the TIC test was released. And it's always uh, good looking at that stuff um, if you are into understanding indicators. Um, another quite interesting piece of work um, was uh, done by... Uh, Pavel Pavlinski and uh, Andrew Kompanek of uh, CERT PL. Um, uh, they published it around 2016, and they were also looking at uh, evaluating uh, TI feeds um, on a large scale and over a long time. Um, and one of the uh, core messages or core results was actually we do need a framework because doing all this comparison and analysis is quite difficult, and that's also where, uh, one part where we took off. Um, so, um, if you're into the field, have a look at the previous research. Always uh, good knowing what's already out there. Um, so, the title states um, uh, basically analyzing uh, vendors um, of, of indicators of compromise or of TI. It's not the same, and we can go into all the details over beer tonight. Um, and um, for our purposes, the best one for our purposes. So, it's, it's important to understand a little bit about our purposes. Um, we operate network sensors. Um, from an architecture point of view, you can think of a managed IDS, um, which si uh, sits in our customer networks. Um, so uh, with our customers, we have multiple sensors with each customer at, at various locations. Um, they, um, they run a version of Suricata. We have some self-developed um, detection capabilities on them, and we can, be, uh, we can push out um, indicators of compromise, we can push out the Ricata rules, we can push out Yara rules, we do file extraction on these sensors to analyze what these sensors see. Um, they are passive, um, so they don't break any sort of encryption, um, and they don't pose an operational threat, um, which is also very important to us. Uh, they just see a copy of that. And 
So that is the stack we are operating, uh, and we are already doing quite a lot of um, things with these sensors, and we set out on a mission to find yet uh, another vendor to supplement our existing um, detection capabilities. Um, if we want to supplement our existing uh, detection capabilities, it is very important to also understand our threat model. Um, like, what do we want to achieve with that? Um, which vendors uh, or which threats are our customers actually facing? Um, and we were founded three years ago with a very strong focus on what's called APT uh, stuff. Um, so instant response and, and TI around APTs. So our customers are uh, facing the traditional Chinese espionage um, campaigns, um, a little bit of the uh, Russian um, uh, originated uh, espionage activities, um, and uh, then to a lesser degree some of the other ones um, that we see. So we are not really interested in the um, in the current Imotet spam campaigns, for example, but very much focused on the APT. Um, last slide on the um, uh, on, on the context. It's basically um, how we um, assume networks are working. We are assuming that they are breached. Uh, we are assuming our customer networks are breached. And we try to detect um, things at a later kill chain phase. So, for example, when there is lateral movement going on, when um, things are being copied from left to right, when, things, when data is being exfiltrated, when there is command and control communication being established, when later stage uh, malware is being dropped. Um, so all of that we try to detect with our um, solution. So what we were looking for was um, a vendor who would provide us with additional capabilities in detecting these kind of later stage um, uh, uh, activities of adversaries on our network sensors at our customers. Um, so that is really what we were targeting at, a very, very focused and precise questions we were trying to answer. Um, so, Alicia. Thanks. Um, so that was the context. Now we'll talk you through some of the ideas we had going in about how we wanted the results to look like. Um, so we started by asking some of the researchers and analysts at DCSO, what does a good TI feed look like, in your opinion, um, for the purposes that we had at the time, which is focused on APT indicators? Those were some of the answers they gave us, so low false positive rate, high quality context attached to the indicator, um, some information about the kill chain stage, targets, was the indicator delivered in a timely fashion, is there information um, regarding time to live, um, is the campaign that the indicator is attached to still active, and other um, points as well. That's all great. But how do you go from that list of requirements to metrics that you can then compare um, across the different vendors? So our first sketch looked like that. Um, we thought there were about three large categories that would best represent the areas um, we needed um, to have information on in order to make our decision about which TI vendor to go with. Uh, machine readability is extremely important to us. As Roy mentioned, um, the IOCs that we're looking at eventually needed to go onto a sensor. Um, information analysis, by that we mean the quality of the indicators and do they really suit our needs. And finally, uh, real world performance. We, How do these indicators perform on our sensors? Um, will they make the sensors blow up? Will there be too many false positives? Are they picking up useful information? So um, what we then did is we went into each of these categories and defined various metrics for these categories um, and said, okay, um, we want to have a visual representation. We want to make a very clear um, message within each category uh, what is actually going on. Um, very simple, very uh, very visual based. Um, that was we, what we uh, set out to do, and um, maybe I'm spoiling here a little bit, but uh, we didn't manage to do it like that. Um, so uh, that's why we uh, uh, subtitled this call, uh, uh, this is presentation, uh, trial and tribulations, uh, because we didn't really succeed with all of that. Um, so um, we then went into the uh, provider selection phase, um, and at this point I need to, uh, to tell you um, this is the only time you will actually see any logos and names. Um, after that, everything is uh, just uh, 
doing with uh, random vendor one to vendor, vendor X. Uh, we, we had great support from a team at DCSO who do vendor scouting, and so they uh, did a lot of scouting, and they came up with a list of around about 25 potential vendors, which might be interesting, um, and we started contacting them. Um, some thought it, um, this was obviously spam or a hoax and never ever replied. Um, so um, we came down to a list of, around, of, of 11 vendors who were of interest, who, uh, who were also interested in working with us, who replied to our emails, um, and we got in contact with them. We started with a very short like um, fact sheet. Um, what kind of company is this? What is their offering? What is their background? Just to do a little bit of preliminary work and a little bit of uh, background checking, more or less. Um, then some of these vendors uh, um, during our discussion said, oh, you know what, at the end of the day, we believe we don't have a product which suits our, uh, your needs. Um, yeah, we, we do have indicators, but not for APT, or um, we don't have a label which is APT, um, whatever. Um, so um, some of the vendors um, also um, said, oh, we do have the data you're interested in, but uh, we are not going to give it uh, to you for testing, comparing, or for doing a POC. Um, so that at the end of the day, out of the 25, through a down selection process, it came down to four which uh, actually had interesting data and were willing to share that data with us for um, this POC purpose. Um, so, and I'm not going to tell you which four these are uh, at the end of the day. Sorry for that. Not even uh, over peers. <laughs> uh, well, we would be breaching NDAs and things like that, so so yeah, it really needs to um, stop at that. Um, so, Alicia. Yeah. So at this point, we have the data, and we need to figure out how to store it. First of all, one of our wishes was that we would get the data, line all the vendors up, and then turn them on and have three weeks where we're just ingesting data from these three, well, three or four vendors, and at the end of that, we'd be able to compare them and be like, okay, this one delivered that IOC first, that one uh, delivered that many more IOCs compared to that one. That didn't work out. Um, there were some delays in negotiations, some implementations took a while, and then we also had some differences on the level of the data itself, like um, some vendors uh, offered reports and others had IOCs that would, were being updated at much more frequent uh, in uh, intervals than the reports. So for example, a report would come out maybe once every uh, few days versus um, multiple IOCs being released every few hours. It didn't really make sense to um, for focus ourselves only on a two, three period that would potentially take a few of those um, vendors out of, the, out of competition. So what we did, we used this window wherever it was possible to get an idea of, okay, how, how would it look like if we had these two vendors um, at the same time on our sensors? Um, but we also took into account some historic data too and tried to work with it in the best possible way. And we'll get into that a little bit more later on. Um, yep. Next, uh, like we said at the beginning, we were interested in, well, we hoped that we would be able to plug all these vendors into a common platform with a common data format in which we could compare them. Um, yeah, so we discussed potential solutions. And the first one that came up was the MISP. Uh, which we're big fans of. Um, we also have our own MISP project and devel developers in the house uh, that do the MISP Dockerize, which is a Docker version of the MISP. And the MISP um, has some great features, like you can correlate uh, indicators. So an indicator that's been published by one vendor would then appear as correlated to the another vendor if that other vendor also had it. Um, unfortunately, that didn't work out. Um, like I said, there were differences not only in the frequency of the updates, but also the structure of the data itself. Uh, we weren't able to build a one-to-one -one mapping between the data that the different vendors gave us and the MISP format. And I don't think this is a drawback of the MISP. This is simply, we couldn't find a solution out there and we didn't want to put all our time into developing plugins for the various vendors, very well knowing at the end that we would only go with one, perhaps two. Um, do you have anything to add? No? Oh. All, right. All right. So at this point, let's have a look at our mission. Uh, unfortunately, we've had to drop. So compare TI vendors using a standard format failed. Um, but 
we still have other objectives and yeah. that were online. Yeah. So we actually ended up um, really analyzing each vendor by itself for its own um, with a lot of Python code and Lisha wrote uh, using Jupyter notebooks, yeah. um, huh. uh, which are so difficult to share. <laughs> they're custom. Well, they're vendor specific. So yeah, yeah, um, great. All right, so at this point, we have the data, and like perhaps I should say a little bit more. Um, so I worked on the data on, in these Jupyter notebooks, um, and these were sometimes uh, data that came through the MISP API, but in other cases, it was just a raw data dump of JSONs or sticks um, that I was just uh, worked and extracted the information I needed in order to compare it across the different vendors. But more of that soon. Um, great. So before we talk about the metrics, uh, I'd like to quickly point out what I mean by APT IOC in this context. So I'm new to cybersecurity. My background is maths and data science and other fields. So I inherently don't really know what an APT IOC is. So I'm reliant on tags, on labels. Something needs to tell me in the data that this is APT. Um, so for the purpose, well, we decided um, to go with that definition. So for the purpose of our project, APT IOCs were IOCs that somehow had perhaps a threat actor attached to them in the data uh, or any other kind of metadata that could um, be labeled as, I as APT. Um, so some of the metrics we considered were the total number of APT IOCs that the, ver that the vendor provided, uh, how many of those IOCs were derived from open source intelligence, um, the overlap with our own internal data feeds, um, how quickly the uh, vendors delivered those IOCs if they delivered the same as other vendors within um, the POC, um, the geographic focus, so which, uh, where were these IOCs coming from? So um, looking at the sources, and also how did what was the split? Like, are, were we talking about network indicators or files? Um, yeah. So a bit more. Okay. So we'll start with. I won't go into every single metric. Uh, we picked out a few. Uh, one of them being timeliness. So how often was a vendor first to report compared to others? Um, so you can see, for example, vendor two reported over three quarters of the time an IOC first. Um, that, yeah, the, that was one view that we were interested uh, yeah. in and um, eventually became part of the scorecard. Yeah, but uh, if, you, if you look at timeliness, I mean, there, is, uh, there are more um, questions to ask um, on the, um, you know, who, who was first. Um, when we talk about um, APTs and um, if you're, um, if you've ever done um, APD incident response or analysis, um, you probably know that. Um, we are usually talking about long-lasting campaigns uh, which have been with the customer for quite a while. I mean, we've seen uh, um, instances where um, customer were breached nine years ago um, and it took them nine years to actually uh, find traces of, of these breaches. So um, if vendor A tells me about an indicator two or three weeks before vendor B, in our specific context, is that really relevant or not? Um, so that's the kind of question we were asking ourselves. So if I'm trying to catch Emotet as a spam campaign, yeah, which is over within uh, 45 minutes, then two or three weeks is way too long. If I'm talking about APT campaigns, maybe the time dimension is not that important. And if vendor B, who reports second, adds more context, that helps me understand this information much better. Maybe it is even worse waiting these two or three weeks and go for the what, copycat, um, who's uh, just using the data and adding adding more context. So, um, if you if you look at previous work, um, um, I always found this uh, focus on um, dominance or, or you know, who was first um, quite quite. Um, um, mm, Interesting because um, no one challenged the first equals better assumption. It's just an assumption everyone makes that first equals better. Um, but um, if you look at use cases um, and, and you come up with your own use cases for, for using indicators, do challenge that assumption. Yeah. 
Um, another metric we considered was false positives. Um, so we shared this information back with the vendors themselves and the false positives sparked the biggest discussions. Obviously, no vendor wants to be told they have any false positives. Um, rather than sort of, in this case, for example, you see uh, vendor four on the right has a higher instance of um, IP false positives, and these were false positives that we detected using our own lists. That was not so much, I would say, that's a bad feed. It was more for us a lens to understand the feed better. Like, what were the indicators that were popping up um, as uh, false positives from that feed? And we discovered, for example, in that case, that uh, many of those were IP addresses from content delivery networks. Um, so it was more a process. I think it's worth pointing out at this point that we use these metrics both to question like our own methods, like how are we measuring false positives, but also how are these feeds building, um, putting together their data? Perhaps they have a different understanding of what should be in a feed um, versus us. Yeah. Finally, uh, this is the last metric uh, we want to present. Um, we, this one was, so you can see it's, geographic focus versus the data types. Um, so for example, if you look at the top left corner, that feed has a higher, has a, is more specialized in Chinese um, indicators, threat actors, and um, well, below their network and file. So you can see, for example, yeah, that vendor one is more specialized in network indicators from China, and perhaps vendor two has a heavier focus on uh, file indicators, unfortunately, we had to classify some of them as unknown because there wasn't enough metadata attached to the indicators. Again, this was a challenge of trying to fit these different feeds into the same box. Um, but still, this was a lens with which we were able to look at the different feeds and try and make our decision. Yeah. Um, quick question. Uh, who can spot the antivirus vendor in here? Anyone? Where, where is the anti? There is a, a traditional antivirus vendor. Just shout out loud. Windows three. Why? Files. Uh, yeah. Um, so exactly. So when when we're talking about file indicators, what they usually do, they just dump a massive amount of uh, uh, MD5 hashes at you, um, and uh, it's quite easy to produce uh, millions of, of MD5 hashes, um, and. Um, we, to be honest, we found them less useful than the network-based indicators. Um, so, just another thing. But this this picture is actually um, the one where um, we uh, gained the most insight out of um, in really understanding what the vendors are are um, providing um, to us. So, from all the analysis that we did, for me as a security um, analyst, um, this one is the one where I said, okay, now I understand the difference between the different vendors. Everything else before that, like this one is first, there is this percentage of overlap, they're using um, a lot of open source. Um, all the other stuff we did, um, they have a high false positive rate. All the other stuff we did is, is interesting, but for me, this is the real, um, the real beef. It's like, okay, now I know that vendor um, in, in the, in the um, top left, in the bottom left corner, sorry, has a very strong focus on Iranian um, threat actors. If I then go back to my threat model, my threat model tells me, for example, I'm, I'm doing petrochemicals. And whenever, whenever I do petrochemicals from a business perspective, I know in my threat model that I'm a target for Iranian threat actors. So if I would be in the petrochemical um, branch, I would very much look at or start talking to this vendor about okay, maybe it makes sense to include this information into my overall TI program. Because then, we are, then I'm really uh, taking the right approach in, into thinking about capabilities. And then I can see, okay, then I can say, okay, if, if, if I have this um, um, vendor with Iranian um, information, how much of that is unique? Or do I have that information in, in one of the others too? Right? Uh, but that is the correct approach into understanding what you actually get. So, mission completed. Um, at this point, we focus, well, 
Yes, <laughs> we made a decision um, based on some of well the metrics, but also other aspects. Um, for example, machine readability, we didn't even we didn't describe with metrics. That was more feel and actual hands-on. Did it work? Did it not? What were the problems? Um, similarly, with real-world performance, we didn't go into any detail uh, today. Uh, but that was also we did some tests and. Uh, Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's, you know, I'll leave we, it at we, that we, for we, now. We, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, great. Unfortunately, there were a few things that we had to abort. Like we already said, we weren't able to use the standard format. Um, unfortunately, that also compromised the open source tooling aspect of the project because so much of the code was specific to the vendor. Um, we were able to develop metrics, at least for ourselves, um, to help us in making the decision. And yeah, we still have one more open point. Yeah, it's like you're sharing stuff, uh, which we're doing right now. But um, maybe let, let's come to, to some of the takeaways. Um, so um, we split this up in, in takeaways for uh, vendors. I hope uh, some TI vendors are present. Uh, and uh, takeaways for blue teamers and uh, takeaways for researchers. Um, so there's uh, multiple takeaway slides. Um, with the vendors, uh, sometimes we had the impression the vendors weren't eating their own dog food. Um, like, you know, they made it so difficult to work with the API that we really believed that, uh, um, that no one is using that. Um, there were instances of, of nested APIs with nested data, which was then packed, where you had to use multiple certificates to, to get to the data. I mean, it, it was just, uh, you know, XML wrapped in JSON um, kind, of, uh, kind of stuff. Um, so... Um, if you're a vendor, please start using your own products uh, because then you will feel the pain. Um, spend more data, uh, more more time with data people. <laughs> um, that's uh, one of my big lessons uh, that I learned. Um, spending more time with data people is is uh, well uh, invested time because they make you think about what you really want to um, get out of data um, and make you uh, be very specific. Document um, also going through the vendors um, the. Um, uh, quality of the document uh, documentation was uh, um, quite uh, variable. Uh, there was very good documentation, there was very bad documentation. There was even one vendor um, who, uh, after we finished the, uh, the, the project, um, approached us with, oh, you used the wrong API. And we're like, yeah, well, why don't you tell us, why, why didn't you tell us beforehand? We, we told you what we were trying to do. Ah, uh, yeah, well, we forgot, we didn't know. Um, so, sort of like, understand your product is also something uh, um, uh, which we try to recommend to vendors and make it easy to, to compare to others. So everyone's trying to add some sort of magic, my own source, and I'm trying to hide and trying not to give with the, with the uh, trying not to be clear and precise about the data. So they, our impression was they make it deliberately hard to compare them to each other. Um, and that should not be the case. I, at some point, I was reminded at um, um, uh, the uh, mobile phone tariffs. Have you ever tried to compare mobile phone tariffs? I mean, it's become much easier now with with flat rates and stuff. But like five or ten years ago, um, it was the the the, the uh, mobile phone providers made it deliberately hard to compare um, tariffs, and it's basically the same here. And the last one for, for the vendors, and this is, uh, I, I really love this um, uh, picture, and I have to give credit uh, to, to the author of that. Um, uh, so I, I, I was told uh, of, to, um, about that uh, triangle by Ralf Virovsky of Bayer, uh, of the Sock of Bayer. Basically, there are three dimensions, um, fast, accurate, and complete, and you can only choose two of these. So if you're a vendor, tell us where in this triangle your product is. Are you fast and complete, then we know to expect um, inaccuracy. If you are accurate um, and fast, we, we, we know we uh, must not expect uh, completeness, for example. So it's quite important to understand that and really makes a lot of sense to think about it. Um, so much for the, uh, for the vendor side. Um, now, I assume there are more blue teamers in here uh, than vendors. Um, so this is more for, for the blue teamers. Spend more time with data people. Um, again, um, it is uh, every minute invested talking to, to data people like Alicia is um, uh, well invested because they will make you think about your problem in a different way um, and they, they have a different point of view and they challenge you um, and uh, so it really uh, is something which you 
uh, need to get into. Then, of course, we all know indicators of compromise are not the real TI stuff. Um, so um, try to uh, move up um, you know, on the abstraction level of threat intelligence. Um, try to understand the threat model, and then uh, from the threat model, the, the, um, the adversaries and um, their TTP. So look into the MITRE tech framework, for example, to model that. Um, and then uh, you can work at a very different level instead of just um, um, hunting IP addresses uh, and that. And then also, um, you know, accept that failure is part of the process. Um, also quite frustrating, but a good takeaway and a good learning. And again, um, having a look at the um, triangle, um, figure out what, we, what you want. Think about your use cases. Um, do you need fast and accurate data, for example, to um, um, block a phishing campaign? Or do you want a, um, a complete and accurate picture, but, and, and then you can live with delay? Um, so really um, understand what you want to get out of it. And, and then uh, once you know what you, what you need and what you're expecting, go to the vendor you're talking to or to the provider and ask them um, to um, place a product. And then you can see if it matches or not. It's very simple. Um, it's a very, very simple check um, like that. And then maybe um, for the... Uh, <laughs> uh, Data people, security researchers. Can I step in? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so from a data scientist standpoint, really think about your use cases. And this isn't just for the data people in the room. It's also f for you as a team if you're working <laughs> on this problem. Um, it really helps when you have clear use cases in mind. That way you can make decisions, like maybe decide not to work with a vendor right at the beginning rather than try and fit everything into the same box. Um, accept that you can't measure everything. It's okay to drop fields. If you know what you need the fields for, then just ignore the others. At least that was <laughs> my view on that. And also revis revisit the question, what makes an IOC? APT. So this kept coming back during the project, and there were some researchers that really did not like um, the idea of lab like labeled data as being an APT IOC. They said, yeah, sure, but there's also lots of stuff out there um, that isn't labeled. What about that? Um, I'm not saying there's a right answer or a wrong answer. Um, try and spend time on that question and come up with a working definition, something that works for you, and roll with it. Yeah. yeah. Um, like one of our colleagues, um, he kept uh, saying, "Oh well, you have uh, you have a lot of bias in in your whole approach because you're looking at uh, labeled data," mm -hmm. um, which, from his point of view, is correct. Um, so basically, we were more judging the uh, uh, capability of uh, vendors to label data as APT data, um, and um, now a completely different approach, which might also work, is take unlabeled data or take labeled data and throw all the data, throw all the labels away, um, just take the, the, the indicator and try to establish for yourself whether that is APT related or not. I mean, that is a completely different question. Very, very difficult probably to achieve uh, because you then need to think about, okay, how do I, um, uh, how do I do data enrichment on, for example, a, a, a domain um, which gives me enough information to determine an, an aptishness. So from a score from zero to one, how aptish is an indicator would be a completely different approach, which we did not try to achieve in here, but would also be very interesting. Sure. Yeah. It would be a project in itself. Uh, a larger project, <laughs> yeah. yes, exactly. Yeah, great. Um, oh. Yeah, so we completed our primary objective, failed on a couple, but also develop some metrics, and we're here sharing this with you, and we're happy to answer questions either now or afterwards. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. I'm glad you got in the mention that a threat data feed is not threat intelligence. It's very, very important to keep that in mind. For most companies... For a lot of companies, any data feed from any threat intelligence vendor will drown your security people. Remember this before you start assessing what you guys presented. They have the organization in place to turn data into intelligence, to enrich, and to evaluate, and that makes it valuable to them. Sorry, just had to get that out before we went into well, questions. You right. uh, yeah. Questions? Uh, hi. 
have you tried to evaluate these vendors based on the number and quality of TTPs they provide compared to IOCs? Oh, uh, so uh, they don't really provide TTPs. And even, um, I mean, we, we went up on the scale. Um, so we uh, also asked them to provide Yara rules and we also provide, uh, asked them to provide uh, Suricata rules. Um, but as soon as you leave the um, um, uh, basis of indicators and rich data, um, it becomes even more complex and more difficult and they simply lose out. So there's almost no vendor doing good Yara rules. Uh, most of them just copy, um, I hope I can say this, uh, Florian Roth's uh, open source Yara rules um, and then uh, push them out again. Um, and um, we did, a, about a year ago, what we did, we did a very thorough look at the um, um, APT reports of various vendors. So there was a different project, not, not this one, um, where we looked at the reporting capabilities and how vendors um, reacted to requests for intelligence. So when we asked them questions, intelligence-related questions, how was the reply? Um, and we had a set of um, standardized questions and went through vendors um, and gave them all the same questions and, and, and rated their replies. Um, and in there, we did see a very big variance in um, reporting quality and also in replying quality too. But that was something completely different. Thank you. Any f Thank you for your presentation, quite interesting. Um, one of the questions I had, I might have missed it at the start, but I was wondering if you also thought about looking into um, um, trust communities or Isaacs and information shared over there, because it's also quite interesting to see on, as well on timeliness, quality, and the other measurables you tried to, to achieve, on how are these, um, uh, how far are these compared yeah. to the other vendors? Yeah. Because in the end, it's, it's all a decision about, okay, in one way, maybe you spend money, in another way, maybe you spend time and energy, yeah. and in which way is there quite a, a balance between yeah. those? Yeah, um, so we're active in some of the um, sharing circles. Um, and um, we do see um, also in there, um, they, they are very different. Uh, each one has their own uh, pros and cons. But for this project, we were actually explicitly looking for a commercial vendors to supplement our existing solution. So it was basically out of scope to have a look at the um, sharing circles, trust communities, OPSEC, and things like that. To your point uh, on spending time with data scientists, uh, how much time do you usually spend on visualization? Because you mentioned that uh, this one uh, visualization of the reporting was like the, the best thing you had in the entire project to evaluate stuff. So uh, one of the things I'm always wondering is I, I usually people have a ton of data, but looking at data that uh, humans can actually understand it is quite complicated and I, I'm kind of wondering how much time should you spend on visualizing your data to yeah. actually extract yeah. good things. Yeah, you're, you're quite, yeah. uh, not enough is the way I would say. I mean, yeah, I think if I could go back and do it again, I would probably do it in sprints and like share the visualizations, get feedback, because I had that with a few, and I shared that with a few people, and they were like, what are you trying to share here? So we stripped it down, we stripped it down, and in the end we had maybe four or five that were really sending a message. Um, yeah. So I did spend time, uh, but there's, you could spend a lot more. Um, and it's really the feedback I think that's important because you become blind mm -hmm. to the data and um, you have to really think about the message. And I think that's quite hard as a data scientist or coming from a different background, not really, in some ways it's good because it means I have a fresh perspective, but on the other hand, I sometimes I'm not sure what is the story we're trying to tell here? Like what is the important part of this visualization? What, what do I really want to highlight? And I really need the feedback from the security researchers on that. Do you have any literature on diagrams or something for something uh, like that? Yes. Um, can I get back to you afterwards? Or I can sure. Share. <laughs> it's one of those moments where I'm having a blank on the name. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, there's this. Uh, there's a there's a classic on uh, visualization of security data. That's uh, Rafi Marti yeah. um, security visualization. That is actually the only printed book that I know that deals with 
visualization of security data. Um, I don't know if there's anything else out there, but that's uh, uh, Rafael Marti. Um, yeah. But there's also, I mean, there are law on information visualization, yes. which also apply. Um, but I'll get back to you on that. Yeah. And that's it. We're out of time. If you have further questions, please catch them later. You will be around? Yeah, we will be around. One last thing, picture credit. There was this wonderful background picture uh, of Aurora Borealis over a Norwegian fjord. It's a Creative Commons uh, share alike by attribution, so we're doing the attribution. And our pre presentation is under the same license. Thank you. Thank you.